So, today we want to discuss how NMR spectrum is actually recorded and it can be recorded in two ways one by using continuous wave radio frequency and by using pulsed radio frequency. So, uh, nowadays nobody uses continuous wave radio frequency, but still just for the sake of completeness of the discussion, we will briefly discuss about CW NMR to start with and then we will move over to FT NMR. Since CW NMR you could get resonance in two ways. Remember the energy gap between alpha spin and beta spin is created by application of a magnetic field and you might remember that as we increase magnetic field the splitting also enhance it increases. So, uh, for the same alpha and beta spin for a greater magnetic field uh, the energy gap will be more and it will come into resonance with a different radio frequency. And what we essentially want to uh, investigate is different groups of uh, protons which come into resonance at uh, different radio frequencies. If it is a 100 megahertz machine, it is a 100, 100.1, 100.2, 100 and 102, so on and so forth. So, one thing we could do is we could vary the magnetic field and you get a situation like what is shown here. As you vary the magnetic field and when we say vary, I do not mean go from 100 megahertz to 500 megahertz, I mean go from 100 megahertz, uh, well sorry what I was saying, uh, 12 tesla to uh, uh, 20 tesla, what I mean is 12, 12.1, 12.2 like this, we vary the magnetic field slowly and then at different magnetic fields, different groups of protons come into resonance and that is how you get the spectrum. The other way of doing it is the more conventional way hold the magnetic field constant and tune the radio frequency. Then also different groups of protons will come into resonance at different frequencies and you get your spectrum where your x axis is nu L. So, the question is which one is easier? Actually both are easy, none of them is difficult, but it is conventional to use the first approach. Changing magnetic field is really easy because if you have a big field, you just attach small e electromagnets and power them to change the magnetic field very conveniently, right. So, in CW NMR spectroscopy it is conventional to vary the magnetic field and get the protons into resonance at different fields, ok. But you know what nobody does it anymore, nobody does it anymore because this uh, if you use pulsed NMR, uh, if you use pulsed radio frequency then a lot of advantages come. Towards the beginning of the course we have discussed uh, the advantages of uh, FT spectroscopy, there are many advantages right, uh, multiplex advantage, Felgate advantage so on and so forth, many advantages are there, you get uh, much better signal to noise ratio and more importantly when you use pulsed uh, radio frequency, you can do a lot beyond just recording the spectra. As we are going to discuss very very briefly, you can use different pulse sequences to uh, investigate not just the spectra, but phenomena going on in the system. What we are not going to discuss here is that for complex molecules where it is not so easy to get uh, uh, spectra with few lines that you can assign easily, you can do what is called 2D NMR, ok. So, a lot can be done using pulses that is why uh, almost everybody in the world uses FT NMR. So, so what we will try to learn is how does FT NMR work. So, in FT NMR of course, this is something that you know very well. What you do essentially is you record the data in time domain and if it is a uh, monochromatic radiation, then you get a sine wave or a cosine wave. If it is polychromatic radiation, then you get this kind of a beating pattern. You get what is called an interferogram. And then using this Fourier transformation, these integrals, you can switch from time domain to frequency domain with uh, no trouble at all. In fact, it happens at the click of a mouse. I think 99 percent of people who use NMR spectroscopy have never seen, 99 percent maybe too much, maybe let us say 90 percent have never even seen this integral ever in their lives because it just comes at the click of a mouse it is a black box ok, you do not have to do anything. But if you go and see the NMR spectrum being recorded, you see two things, one is raw data and finally, you get process spectra. 
So, a lot of things actually go on before you can get that nice spectra that we see. So, before we talk about pulse sequences let us uh, introduce ourselves to this concept of bulk magnetization vector ok. You know very well that uh, the energy gap is not very much radio frequency as we discussed is in the lowest energy regime of the electromagnetic spectrum that we have discussed so far ok. So, uh, it is not very difficult to understand that the upper level if you have alpha and beta for this small energy gap the higher energy level will also have significant population right and a simple calculation is shown here for uh, 400 megahertz. So, B0 is 9.5 tesla delta e is like 3.8 into 10 to the power minus 5 kilocalorie per mole. So, n alpha by n beta is 1 point uh, usually lose count of zeros here 1.000064. So, generally when well you are all uh, not all most of you are going to uh, engage in BS project or MSc project next semester onwards. So, you will see when you make your project presentation it is very common for students to show a lot of decimal places and then it makes our life very simple because we can ask this question uh, do all those numbers make any sense do you have that kind of a precision ok. And generally we say go up to second place of decimal here if you go up to second place of decimal it is 1.00 you actually have to go to so many places to understand that there is a uh, difference in populations of the lower and upper level right. But as you can understand this difference in population is not very much ok. However, there is a difference nevertheless. So, what is the effect and uh, uh, when you say net difference in population what are we saying? We are saying that we have a number of nuclei that have up spins like this remember that cone we had discussed that cone that uh, we said that for the spin angular momentum vector theta is defined, but phi is not defined right. So, anywhere on the cone right. So, we can think of these uh, 1 million uh, nuclei having their uh, spin angular momenta like so momentum vectors like this and then you have a little less number pointing downwards ok. So, these are all vectors right. What will the vector sum look like if the population of up spins is a little more than population of down spins yeah. What will be the vector sum? You better give me give the answer quickly because I mean how much longer will I hold this dance pose yeah what will it look like? Yes, like this agreed along z axis like this it will not be very large, but it will point upwards ok. So, this is called the bulk magnetization ok. What we are shown showing here is that this is the direction of B magnetic field B 0. So, a vector sum of all these spins is aligned with this magnetic field we call it bulk magnetization m 0 and the length of that arrow will of course, depend upon what is the difference between the populations of alpha spin and beta spin all right. Now, see this is the uh, interesting part how do we record NMR spectra what we do is this you have this magnetic field already and then you have the bulk magnetization vector aligned with the magnetic field. Now, all this I did not really draw all these figures I took it from this uh, link that is shown here. So, what you do is you apply a uh, radio frequency and the reason why you show a coil is we discussed already right radio frequency usually is well given or uh, detected by using coils. So, the radio frequency is such that at least for now let us say the magnetic field is along say y axis ok. To start with due to the presence of B 0 bulk magnetization vector is along z axis and for now let us say that the magnetic field due to the radio frequency is along y axis. The situation is a little more complicated than this and I am hoping that one of you is going to ask me about that 
So, by the end of this discussion we will come there as well for now just let us say bulk magnetization and this is your uh, what I am calling B1, B1 is the magnetic field associated with the uh, radio frequency. Why are we considering uh, magnetic field and not electric field? Vikas has asked that question, are you, you are all answered now because we are dealing with bulk magnetization right. So, magnetic field is what is important here, we have talked about magnetic dipole moment. Now see I think you have read this, you have a field in this direction and you have this magnetization vector along this direction. What will the response of the magnetization vector be to this uh, magnetic field B1? It will start precessing, isn't it? Remember precession? We had briefly talked about precession earlier when we talked about spins, right? It will start precessing like this. Okay. And when I say like this, I'm cheating a little bit, but we'll come to that. It start precessing. All right. So now, how long you keep this B1 field on is in your hands. If it is permanently on, then what do you expect? If nothing else happens this precession will keep on taking place ok, right and there will be some kind of a precession frequency, Larmor frequency remember, yeah. So, if there is a frequency then you can work out how much time it will take for this bulk magnetization vector to do one full circle right 360 degrees, one fourth of that time is the time that is required to turn bulk magnetization vector by 90 degrees. Is that right? Yeah. So, if you keep your radio frequency on for that amount of time and after we are done with this discussion, we are actually going to discuss what that time can be for a given magnetic field. Okay. It will turn out that it uh, is in the microsecond regime. Okay. So, if you keep B1 on for a time that is required for this spin, uh, this bulk magnetization vector to rotate by 90 degrees then what are you doing? You are using pulsed in a pulsed radio frequency, is not it? What is the meaning of pulse? Initially it is off, you turn the light on, keep it on for some time and then you turn it off, that is a pulse, lightning is a pulse, ok. Uh, so, this pulse that is on for a sufficient time to rotate the bulk magnetization vector by 90 degrees is called a 90 degree pulse. Okay. We are entering unfamiliar territory, okay. we will go step by step. You might not see right now what is there at the end of the discussion, just bear with me. Tell me whether you have understood what we have discussed so far, yeah, sure. What I am saying is this, you apply the radio frequency, radio frequency is associated with a magnetic field and you place your coil in such a way that this magnetic field associated with radio frequency is along y axis and B0 is along z axis. So, bulk magnetization, magnetization vector is also along z axis. So, what I am saying is the moment you switch this B1 on, this vector will start precessing, right. And then when it precesses, it go, it takes some time, right. It is not as if in zero time it uh, come, does a full circle. Depending on what is the strength of B1, right, the time of precession will uh, be determined, ok. What I am saying is you keep B1 on only for the time it takes for the vector to turn by 90 degrees, then it is called a 90 degree pulse. Now, tell me if I keep it on for double that time, what will happen? It will turn by 180 degrees, that is called a 180 degree pulse, as simple as that, ok. So, you, you can keep the pulse on for whatever amount of time you want and turn this bulk magnetization vector by whatever uh, number of degrees you want, ok. But what is useful? in this discussion is 90 degree pulse, all right. Why is it useful? Because see this is your 90 degree pulse. The reason why we are so uh, obsessed with the 90 degree pulse is that your detector is placed along x axis, ok. See all the three axes are made use of. Along z axis you apply the magnetic field. So, your initially prepared magnetic uh, bulk magnetization vector is along z axis. Along y axis you apply B1, the magnetic field associated with radio frequency. 
you keep the redetector along x axis. So, now see as long as you do not apply the uh, b 1 as long as you do not apply radio frequency will the detector give you any signal. Because bulk magnetization vector is along z detector is along x they are orthogonal to each other. So, I hope it is not very difficult to understand that before application of b 1 you do not see any signal in the detector at all right. So, you apply the 90 degree pulse then you see a big signal in your uh, detector ok. Are you ok so far? Now, think what will happen 90 degree pulse means well at the risk of repeating I will say 90 degree pulse means light has been turned on bulk magnetization vector has rotated then the light has been switched off all right all right at the moment where the light when the light got switched off you get this big signal in the detector ok. The way I have drawn it here you would get a big negative signal right, but that does not really matter you get a big signal, but after that there is no light is not it light has been switched off. Now, what do you have in the system you have this bulk magnetization vector along x where detector is and you still have b 0 the magnetic field what will happen now. First of all this bulk magnetization vector will rotate ok anything else it will also want to go back is not it because what is equilibrium equilibrium is the bulk magnetization vector should be aligned with b 0 ok, but it will not just go back it will process also. So, what kind of motion do we actually get why do not they have stick anymore I have to use a pen then this is a bulk magnetization vector this is b 0 right one kind of motion is this it wants to come back another kind of motion is circular along x y. So, what will be the overall kind of motion it will spiral back is not it right it will spiral back right what will the signal be on the detector two things are there one is it is going around the two components right one is a z component z component decreases with time what about the x y component x y component gives you the larmer frequency ok. So, if it is only one signal you are going to get a sine wave multiplied by maybe an exponential decay damped oscillation. If it is not monochromatic then you get an interferogram multiplied by an exponential function again a damped oscillation, but a little complicated complex damped oscillation ok that is what is called the free induction decay something like this. Uh, for that we need to uh, discuss a little more mathematics that we are which we are not discussing ok, but uh, even if we do not say it is exponential it is not very difficult to understand that it is going to decay right it is going to get damped if you agree with that we are I'm happy ok let us not even worry about whether it is exponential or what it will be a decay. What is the difference between this signal that I am showing you and the interferograms that we are familiar with I will go back quickly and show you yeah what is the difference between this interferogram and the free induction decay that we just saw. No, this is also multiple pulse and actually that is also multiple pulse as we will see damping damping there it basically goes from plus infinity to minus infinity time is not it the maximum amplitude does not go down. So, that is a that is for continuous wave light here the signal actually decays with time that is the only difference ok. But if we can account for that decay if we actually know whether it is exponential 
or by exponential or some other function that we know ok. Then if I do a Fourier transform of this what should I get? I should get the frequency domain spectrum ok. So, that is what happens. So, what the FID I have shown you here is actually for a mixture of two frequencies equal contribution. So, this interferogram, but an interferogram that is damped because the bulk magnetization vector is coming back to z direction ok. So, this is how NMR spectroscopy works, this is how NMR data are recorded. Have you worked with any NMR spectrum so far in the labs? No, but those of you who are going to uh, work in synthetic chemistry especially for your MSc or BS projects, you are going to do a lot of NMR and then what you get in your hand essentially is this, but remember it did not fall from the sky. So, it is also like because here is fond of computers and programming and all right. So, when you write a program you write it in a language that you understand, but machine does not understand that language right. So, it is called a higher level language at least that is what it used to be called when I was a little younger and machine understands only machine language that we do not understand. So, essentially this is machine language the time domain data. If I just give you this time domain data will you be able to tell me what kind of NMR spectrum it is? We do not understand right, we only understand frequency domain. So, this is like your machine language the time domain data, frequency domain data is the higher level language that we understand ok. So, you need to go from one to the other, the way you go is by using Fourier transformation. So, have we understood the discussion so far, is there a question? What did we say? Well, we said so many things, so you do not know which one I am asking now. See at the end we said that when you have only B0 and you have this bulk magnetization vector it is spiraling back right, right. So, it is not just going around in circles it is going in this direction as well. Should the same logic not apply when you apply B1? When we said that we apply B1 and bulk magnetization vector turns right in a circle, but will it only turn like this? will it also not go like this? See even B 1 will try to reorient the magnetic uh, bulk magnetization vector towards itself is not it. So, the motion is not really going to be just like this in the which plane will it be the way we have drawn it the motion will really not be in the z x plane, the motion will be something like this understand. So, by the time this bulk magnetization vector has turned by 90 degrees along x y, it will also go a little bit on this depending on how what the magnitude of B 1 is and that is a problem. Then you do not get this nice free induction decay that we have drawn, you get a more complicated signal. How do you account for that? Yes, that is true. Yeah, but it will record a more complicated function is not it. So, what you do essentially is you need a situation where ok. So, uh, ok what would be a good analogy here? Suppose uh, I want to record somebody who is running ok. If I stand on the ground and I have a movie camera and I record what will I see? The runner comes passes me and goes away right. But suppose I put the camera on a trolley and I keep running with that person at the same speed, then what do I see? I see the arms and legs moving and all right, I see all that motion, but that person is always at the center or wherever it is of my camera right. So, what am I doing here? I am using a relative frame of reference is not it? In NMR also you use a relative frame of reference. What is the meaning of relative frame of reference? What we mean is that this B 1 that we are saying is along y axis. So, when it is turning right it, 
we said this uh, bulk magnetization vector turns like this ok. One component is along y z the other component is like this ok. So, if I can also turn my b 1 in the same way then what happens then you are happy ok. Then you get this free induction decay of course, your detector is still there detector is not moving. So, the signal is a little complicated, but if you can turn the uh, turn b 1 at the same frequency then your problem is solved to some extent. How do I turn b 1? How do I create a relative frame of reference? Rotating frame of reference like this. Suppose you use two radio frequencies ok, but not any kind of radio frequency polarized radio frequency that are polarized perpendicular to you know you know about plane polarization right. So, we are saying that if you have two plane polarized radio frequencies at 90 degrees to each other with a phase difference of 45 degrees, then what happens is if you look at the resultant, the resultant is shown at the end, the resultant actually goes around in a circle, this is called circularly polarized light ok. That resultant is B 1 right. So, we use a mixture of plane polarized radio frequencies at a certain phase difference then you can have b 1 that goes around z axis that is what is done and that is what provides the rotating frame of reference ok. The signal at the detector is still complicated more complicated than the f i d because detector is not moving right. It will be too much to keep moving the if you could move the detector at the same frequency then you would have got the uh, f i d right away, but that would make things a little too messy. So, you get a little more complicated signal, but the software takes care of that ok. So, this is a very uh, preliminary overview of how NMR spectra are actually recorded using a 90 degree pulse. This is what is done in the machines that we use ok, but now it is time to calculate the time duration of 90 degree pulse. This is your problem for proton. Larmor precision frequency is 400 megahertz in a magnetic field of about 10 tesla. I, I can never remember those numbers. So, I have been uh, saying 12 tesla all the time, but it is not it is 9.8 or something. If B 1 along the x direction is 2.5 into 10 to the power minus 4 tesla, then how long should it be on in order to provide a 90 degree pulse? Can we do this calculation? What is the relationship between Larmor frequency and magnetic field? Directly proportional, inversely proportional. So, by unitary method, you can find out the Larmor frequency for B1. If you know frequency, then you can work out the time for one 360 degree rotation and divide it by 4, you get it. Tell me what the answer is. And historically, for the last 13 years, 14 years, somehow I have been giving an incorrect answer let us see whether I have it right this time. Will I answer? Yeah. Can you was 6? Can you was 6 second? That will be too long to record one NMR spectrum time I mean it would take really long to get a PhD if it takes that much time to get one NMR spectrum. 25 second 25 into 10 to the power minus 6 please do not scare me beyond what you have to 25 into 10 to the power minus 6 seconds. So, it is not very much very long right 25 microsecond is the answer ok and microsecond is very convenient because we have enough electronics to provide uh, microsecond pulses. If you are talking about nanosecond, picosecond, femtosecond, attosecond then it is a challenge. Production of pulse is a little bit of a challenge detection is a much bigger challenge 25 microsecond is something that we can handle happily. So, it is not very difficult to do this experiment. So, yes, yes. Yes. So, the thing is do not forget it is just radio frequency light. 
So, it is associated with weak fields that is another reason why I wanted to discuss this. It is much less and also you do not want to use a magnetic field that is comparable to the permanent magnetic field that is there. Okay. You want a small magnetic field that will part of the system just a little bit. So, 25 microseconds. In the same system, if I want a 180 degree pulse, for how long do I have to keep it on? With now, this question is very easy 50 microsecond, right? That is the one. So, why am I so obsessed with 180 degree pulses? That is what we will see in the uh, next couple of modules where you see that we have learned how to record NMR spectra, right? Very good. But by changing the sequence of pulses, we can actually measure times associated with what we call relaxation. What is the meaning of relaxation? Relaxation means that you give light, okay, you disturb the system from equilibrium, right. There are different mechanisms by which it can come back to equilibrium. Some of you might know that two most common mechanisms that we talk about are spin spin relaxation and spin lattice relaxation. Spin lattice relaxation means it gives away the energy to the lattice. Lattice either gets heated a little bit or entropy increases, right. So, all that changes is the z component of the uh, magnetization. Spin spin relaxation, we will study what that means, okay. And I hope we will be able to convince you that it is along x y direction. How much time is it required for the spin 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 lattice relaxation? That is something we can uh, measure by using 90 degree and 180 degree pulses at different sequences with variable time between them. That is what we will learn to conclude this discussion. But before that, let me remember what uh, different scientists have said that unless I show you some experimental result, I cannot claim that what I am saying is true. So, let us complete today's discussion by showing you the spectrum of the one molecule that we have sort of taken fancy to during this course, ethanol. This is well, this is something you are familiar with, but this is the actual time domain data for ethanol, and when you Fourier transform it, then you get the spectrum that we are all very familiar with, okay. And that has been recorded by using this 90 degree pulse that we have discussed so far, okay. That uh, concludes our discussion of how to record NMR spectrum. We will see what more we can do in the next class.